So this is a short video on resilience, introducing trauma and how to prevent and manage trauma. My name is Mark Walsh. I founded the Achilles Initiative. Uh, we provide training for organizations working in areas of conflict and other people under high pressure and stress in order to stay happy, healthy and sane, to keep their relationships healthy and, and to stay productive. This video will actually be useful for anyone. There's a Dutch study I read recently, the lifetime prevalence of traumatic incidents is 80%. So most people will experience something potentially traumatic within their lives. And the Netherlands is a pretty safe place, probably higher in the States and other places. So you're much more likely to need this material than say CPR and a lot of people learn first aid. In fact, you can think of this as trauma first aid and education around trauma. This is really important to me because I think trauma can cause a lot of suffering that it doesn't need to. Um, if, if there's ignorance, if there's stigma around trauma, uh, it, people can do the wrong interventions or they can not get any help and that's really sad because there's, there's a lot that can be done and prevented. So potentially traumatic events are anything which uh, involves a sense of overwhelm or powerlessness. It could be something life-threatening like uh, an assault or a car accident, it could be a childhood abuse, anything that leads to that sense of, of overwhelm and powerlessness. Often traumatic symptoms are acute, meaning they, they fade over time, sometimes without any kind of interventional help, they just naturally fade. We're naturally hardy as people, is, is the term that psychologists use. These symptoms, however, that do often fade include hyperarousal, so that can means you're a bit um, over-agitated, you're like you've had a lot of coffee, but the whole time, so it might be you don't sleep well, it might be you're agitated, you're jumpy, maybe you get aggressive, uh, you have difficulty concentrating, there's some of the hyperarousal symptoms. People may also have what's called avoidance symptoms. So that might be avoiding the stimulus of thing, like avoiding cars if you had a car accident, or emotionally avoiding, so sort of emotionally numbing or drinking too much. That's a common one. There's also reliving symptoms such as uh, thinking about something all the time, like intrusive thoughts or flashbacks, which people often, often have heard of. So these, these things can be really debilitating. There's different um, things like post-traumatic stress disorder or generalized anxiety disorder. There's lots of potential kind of labels that can get put on various various things. I was mostly talking about the, um, the diagnostic criteria for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder there. But even without that diagnosis, you could have some of those symptoms from a traumatic event. And it can be very debilitating. So, you, you know, these two things do lead to addiction. I mentioned divorce. Uh, it could be just, just general unhappiness, you know, people getting fired from work. Um, I've been there myself in the past, so I'm, I'm not uh, ignorant of these things. I've, I've also worked with soldiers in Sierra Leone, I've worked with you know, everyone from stressed professors in the UK to Merlin, who are a disaster relief charity in the UK. We did a job for them recently. So I've seen the, um, the benefits of preventing some of this stuff and the after effect of not. So I mentioned that recovery from trauma is normal, which should be expected. However, um, there's certain things that can be done to speed it up, to uh, make it more likely, shall we say. And it can also be arrested. So, um, if people have had a past trauma or there's another trauma after the one they've had, or there's just cumulative, sometimes it's just cumulative little knocks and eventually there's a straw that breaks the camel's back. So I think it's really worth saying that if you've had a traumatic incident, if you think you're suffering from some kind of trauma symptoms, um, please, please, please do seek professional help. Do talk to your organisation if that's possible, if there's counselling there or seek help outside of that. Um, you know, these are some tips. This is certainly not instead of professional help. Um, do not use YouTube as your doctor. So saying that, what can be done to build our resilience? Um, if we're in a potentially traumatic situation, we know that we have a difficult job, what might we do? Well, first one I think is just keeping good physical health. So diet, exercise, sleep, if at all possible, taking as much care of these things as possible, this will build our resilience. The next one, and maybe the most important thing in this entire video, is social resilience. So we, we're inter-resilient. Our social support networks, keeping those strong and healthy, checking in with people regularly. You know, I've worked with firemen, I've worked with soldiers, and they, um, they often have really good social support. It doesn't necessarily look touchy-feely or kind of like therapists would do it, but they have strong camaraderie and social support, and that is a huge benefit to them. A sense of meaning, some sense of connection to spirituality or some higher purpose, that's particularly useful for people, whatever shape that comes in. Um, and building awareness of body, psychology and emotions, building awareness and skills in managing those things really helps. And that might look like psychology training, might look like yoga, emotional intelligence training, meditation's great, uh, many, many possibilities. You know, just doing sports mindfully and being aware of the body 
So building awareness of body, of emotions and thinking, absolutely critical. So you've got this resilience in place before anything happens. Okay, so what about if something does happen? If let's say uh, you witness a shooting or you're in a car accident, something potentially traumatizing happens. Well, there's three things we always recommend. They are safety and well-being, move and release, process and connect. So there are three things you should be doing immediately after anything that's a shock, basically, a big shock. So um, the first one, you've got to be safe. There's no point trying to do any of the others if you're still in, you know, somewhere you can get hit by a car or if the, your husband's still hitting you, for example, any of those situations, removing yourself to somewhere safe is just number one taking care of your basic physical needs. In other terms of well-being, it might just be, for example, if someone's very cold, you know, I just heard that one of my colleagues in a car accident and it was on the side of the road and it was raining and, uh, you know, getting warm was his first priority there. So being physically, physically cared for is important. Also in terms of well-being is avoiding stimulants. So, um, you know, not smoking too much if you smoke, not drinking lots of coffee, uh, and equally uh, num numbing agents like alcohol, you know, that's the traditional thing, right? Someone has a shot, we give them a brandy. It's like, don't feel. Actually, you want to be feeling your body. So being aware of your body sensation, staying as present as possible, this will help lay down a particular kind of memory rather than a traumatic one. Feeling your body, feeling the sensations. And the other thing that can happen in the body is people can shake. Um, if this happens, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's a natural process. Animals do this. You know, if you see a gazelle that's been attacked by a lion, it escapes, it will shake. Uh, perfectly natural way of getting rid of some of that feeling. You can deliberately do it, you can have a little walk, any gentle exercise, a swim or even a dance, any little gentle exercise where you move the body. There are some specific techniques like the TRE method, the Bocelli method. I really recommend that. Uh, if you've got time to learn those, uh, they are very effective. I've used them myself. Um, but even just a bit of a move and a shake if you haven't learned that. Last one, process and connect. So maybe immediately, maybe a bit later the next day, same evening. Um, processing things, if you want. You don't have to talk about things, but talking about it or writing it down, this can help us process it and again move it from an act, getting stuck in active memory to more of a normal kind of long-term memory. Um, we recommend diffusing, which is one-to-one, -one, confidential and through choice processing rather than kind of forcing people into these group debriefings. Connect, so connecting with your own emotions, talking to friends, physical touch is very good. I'm a big believer that people will heal in intimacy. So um, whether that's between friends or with partners, that, that is very, very helpful. Really the big thing for any kind of connection with self or others is empathy. So non-judgmental, being with someone, listening to them, uh, maybe some touch, but always that sense of empathy. So what about treatment? What, what happens if there is some kind of, you know, you do have a trauma, you do all the right things, but still you develop some symptoms, let's say of an anxiety disorder, or you start developing some of the PTSD symptoms, the post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms I mentioned. Well, that's not the end of the world. As I said, they may fade with time, um, but there's definitely treatments out there that do exist. Um, I think there's no shame in this, because they're, we think of, we have injuries, we have, you know, in the army they have wounds. Well, these are, you can think of them as simply as psychological injuries or psychological wounds, you know, we don't, feel shame when we go to the doctor necessarily, you know, it's, it's, it's just a, we get illness, we, we deal with it. So, uh, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which recommends what's good for what in the UK, they recommend uh, two things, um, CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, and EMDR. Um, EMDR is around about use for eye movements, a little unusual, but it works really well, the evidence shows, I've, I've used it personally, it's good stuff. Um, that, that, that is particularly useful. Other more esoteric ones that are sort of coming in, that I think will be approved at some point. Um, emotional freedom technique I like. Uh, I mentioned the TRE, shaking method. Somatic experiencing, because, because trauma is a body thing, some sense of body therapy, of working with the body rather than just talking about it, I think is really useful. There's even animal assisted approaches using horses and dogs and things like that. And for some people they like to talk, there's something healing about being around animals. Okay, so I hope this has been useful. Please share it with people that you think um, may be in potentially traumatic situations. I think it's just good general knowledge for us all to know actually. I really, I, you know, passionately want this stuff to be out there, I want this information out there. I mean, my granddad was still having nightmares and waking up in cold sweats 50 years after World War II and saying, he's fine, I'm fine, I don't want to talk about it. And I just thought, well, you know, he's not fine. He, that was a problem. And I think it's time we, we moved on from that. 
Uh, again, the disclaimer, please do seek professional help. This is YouTube. This is, you know, this is not the same as seeing a psychologist or a doctor. I'd also like to thank my psychologist and therapist friends and colleagues. So particularly James Clifton and Roger Mills and all the other members of the Achilles team. Uh, thank you. Lots of love going out to you. And thank you for the information that you, you've helped me convey here. If there's any questions you have, please ask them in the comments. Please like it if you've liked it. And uh, if you're looking for more professional training, then please get in touch. Thank you.